I think I mentioned that chapter three was a super, 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 super long chapter, right? So this is your seventh lecture in chapter three. I mean, these lectures aren't super long. So, I mean, if I was actually lecturing in class, I'd have to go over all of this, but it would probably take me two full class days and typical um, lecture period for AMP fundamentals, I think is like one and a half to one hour and 50 minutes. So that you're talking about four hours to cover this material. So yeah, it's a long chapter. Um, but we are almost done. So we're going to cover uh, muscle and nervous tissue, and maybe we'll even get through the um, fibrosis and regeneration in this, in this lecture. We'll see. So we're going to talk about muscle tissue now. Muscles all function in producing movement as a major function. And as a byproduct of movement, they help in producing heat or they produce heat as a byproduct, which helps mm -hmm. to maintain body temperature. There are three types of muscle tissue. We have skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and then smooth muscle. Skeletal muscle is, and so all of these are vascular. They do have a blood supply. Um, not all of these can regenerate, though, very effectively. So skeletal muscle is composed of multinucleate skeletal muscle cells or um, muscle fibers. It is considered a voluntary muscle because we can control it, which is why we can control our body movements. Um, it, it functions in producing movement of the bodies. It's attached to our bones and allows our bones to move. It is striated. That means that you can see lines running through it. And those lines are, are associated with the way the, the myofilaments, the tiny little proteins inside the muscle, um, run together. Skeletal muscle does not regenerate very effectively, though. So when you damage skeletal muscle, it doesn't always get fixed as fast. It doesn't go through um, mitosis like other cells do. So here you can see the muscle fibers. Here's one muscle fiber, and you can see a lot of different nuclei within that muscle fiber. So there's lots of nuclei within one muscle fiber. And then these lines here, these lines that are going up and down on the muscle fiber, those are the striations I was talking about. Okay. Cardiac muscle is also striated for the same reason, those protein myofilaments, the way they run. They typically have one nucleus or they may be binucleate. The cells are very short and they branch. It is considered involuntary because we do not have, um, we can't control how fast or slow our heart pumps. That's not controlled by us, by our um, thoughts. We can't be like, okay, slow down heart, slow down heart. Um, we can slow down our breathing because the diaphragm is skeletal muscle. And in doing so, we might calm our body down, which helps to slow our heart, but our heart itself is involuntary. We don't have to think about it or tell it to beat, and we can't um, increase or decrease it just by our thoughts. Within cardiac muscle, there are these things called intercalated discs. Intercalated discs um, contain different types of protein junctions. So one of those junctions is called a gap junction. Gap junctions are those junctions that allow for cell to cell communication. They also have desmosomes, which hold the cells together. So cardiac muscle is constantly contracting, relaxing, contracting, relaxing. So there's a lot of mechanical stress there. So we have those desmosomes holding those cells together. So here is cardiac muscle. And 
these um, li these lines going up and down are the inter are the um, striations, and you see these dark pink structures. Those are the intercalated discs. And then you can see there's space between cardiac muscle. Um, these are because you have branched muscle fibers. It's very branched in structure. And then we have, oh, and cardiac muscle does not um, repair itself very effectively. It doesn't go undergo mitosis like other cells, so it doesn't regenerate. Smooth muscle, on the other hand, is great at regeneration. So this is our one regenerative muscle that we have. It is also involuntary, which means we don't control it. Um, we find smooth muscle throughout our entire body. Uh, it lines the walls of our organs, our internal organs, like our stomach, our intestines. Um, and it functions in movement of material throughout the body. The um, smooth muscle is considered, is called smooth because there are no striations, and that's because the proteins don't run in the same directions as in cardiac and skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle always has only one nucleus per cell, and they have a spindle shape. So here's smooth muscle, and you can kind of see that spindle shape moving up and down, up and down for one cell. So it kind of looks like, I always think of cat's eyes, except for the nuclei are also um, elongate instead of going up and down. That's, you know, it's kind of got that eye shape with a very elongate nucleus within each. Um, and so here you can see it over here as well. The last tissue we're going to talk about then is nervous tissue. Nervous tissue um, functions in taking in signals, sending those signals to a control center, and then responding to the information that occurred. Um, and so it is able to pull in information, which means it can pick up stimuli or it has the ability to be irritatable. And it can conduct that information through the entire cell structure to neighboring cells. Um, the two types of cells associated with nervous tissue are neurons and nerve cells, or neurons and neuroglial cells. Neurons are the cells that actually are um, able to send an input pick up information and send it along to neighboring cells. Neuroglial cells are your support cells. So here is a neuron, and here you can see those same neurons, beautiful um, photomicrograph. And then outside, all these tiny little structures, those are neuroglial cells. Neuroglial cells outnumber neurons, um, but they function in support of the nervous system or of those neurons. Um, we find nervous tissue and the brain, spinal cord, and in the ganglion. Neurons themselves are not able to regenerate or not able to undergo mitosis in general. There are some, some specific um, exceptions to that rule, which we'll talk about in the nervous system chapters. Neuroglial cells, on the other hand, are highly regenerative, so they can um, replicate. So here again, um, we just have the examples of the different tissues, uh, basic functions, and um, where they're located throughout the body. At this point, you should be able to answer the remaining tissues. You should also be able to tell me, hold on one second, I apologize. Dudley, no, that's my dog. You know him probably by now. Um, which type of tissues are avascular? Which ones are highly vascular? Which ones undergo mitosis and which ones can't? Okay. The last thing we're going to talk about, and I am going to add this into this because it's only a 10 minute video and I think I can finish this in about five minutes, is tissue repair. 
So this is wound healing. There are two basic um, ways that wounds heal. They either are going to be healing through regeneration, where we replace the damaged tissue, or through fibrosis, where we um, get we form scar tissue in that area. So here's an example of a wound on the hand on the palmar surface, anterior of the hand. Um, regeneration occurs when damage is not that severe. So this damage here occurred um, from a fall during running and the damage was not that severe, though it hurt a lot. There was some bleeding. Um, it only took off the the top layer, the in, the top layer, the epidermis of the integument, and it cut into that dermal layer a little bit. So here you're seeing that same wound during the healing process. So um, what I did was I watched the wound heal and I took pictures and now I'm showing you those pictures. Here it's much closer to healed, um, looks much better here. And hold on, there it's gone. So there's no damage. So that's regeneration. Um, the time it takes for regeneration to occur will depend on the severity of the wound. So if it was a deeper wound, it might take longer. This one took um, only a couple of weeks to repair itself. But regeneration can only occur if the damage is not too severe. So if the damage is super deep, here we have a wound on the dorsum of the hand and you can actually see bone. So this is a very deep wound. Um, in this case, the wound um, is going to heal through fibrosis. So we're going to have some regeneration of some of the tissue, but there's going to be scar tissue forming. So um, this was not me, but you can see that scar tissue here formed. Um, so I don't have pictures on a daily basis like I did on my hand. Um, this is my nephew and he cut his hand while working with some, I don't even know which uh, tool, but he was working on something, cut his hand, um, took pictures. He had to have surgery. Obviously, there, I mean, that was a very bad deep cut. Um, they had to reattach nerves because otherwise his hands wouldn't work properly. And um, now his hand works almost the same as normal, which is a good thing. But he does have scar tissue, and you can see that scar tissue where there's connective tissue that formed. So tissues um, that typically regenerate relatively easy are going to be your, your skin, um, your bone, Blood regenerates, um, where or blood undergoes mitosis, I should say. Whereas tissues that don't regenerate very effectively are going to be things like skeletal muscle, um, tissues that are almost always replaced with scar tissue would be your nerves and cardiac muscle. And so at this point, I think this is your last slide as well. What is regeneration? What is fibrosis? Which tissues can regenerate easily? Which tissues don't? And when does scar tissue form? So I am done. This chapter is finally done. Woohoo! This is a long chapter, wasn't it? Um, and so I will get these posted through Edpuzzle and then you can watch them. Have a great day. Bye.